Complejidad del derecho de propiedad intelectual ante la eclosión de la inteligencia artificial. Manuel de Santas Real, Universidad de Alicante, España. Aurelio López Taruela Martínez, Universidad de Alicante, España. Luz Sánchez García, profesora en la Universidad de Murcia. España. Moderador Javier Fernández Laschetti, profesor del IE Law School y socio El Saburu, España. Good afternoon, everybody. For those listening to me in Spain, welcome to this table on intellectual pro the perplexity of intellectual property law before the emergence of artificial intelligence. It's clear we are experiencing a burst of AI, and I have good and bad news. The good news is that Terminator won't end with us. The Bad news is that perhaps many of the work human beings conduct will be replaced by machine activity. I recently listened to Professor Jose Alamin Pim Arboleda mentioning the perspectives for work in the future and discuss things that humans will do, machines will do, and things we will do together. Human beings will head, judge, imagine, and take complex decisions, machines will repeat all sorts of things, will do the procedures and predict as the weather and will join all this and machines will contribute with human beings and we will train machines, we will uh, explain how they work and will have to maintain and control them, monitor them. So the future will be different. All aspects of the economy and the world will be impacted and IP uh, likewise. This is why we have opened this uh, period for thinking about changes coming in IP in relation with AI. For this, we have three uh, very highlighted uh, academics that will are working in this field of AI and in intellectual and industrial property. Professor Manuel de Santis, who is known to all, he has already been introduced. He will refer uh, to this in general terms. Professor Aurelia Lopez Tarija, that will discuss issues more regarded regarding copyright and IP, and Maria Luz de Sanchez, that will to issues regarding patents. I won't uh, waste more uh, time because we want them to have 10, 12 minutes each to make their presentations and then we'll have time for a debate together with the audience. We're open to any questions that may arise and we will be very pleased to answer all those possible, uh, hopefully many. Well, without further ado, I hand the floor to Professor Manuel de Santis, who will discuss this topic in 
its context for us to later analyze it in different aspects. Manuel, the floor is yours. Hello, Javier. Thank you for your introduction and thank you, Asipi. For those who know me, you know well how heartfelt uh, is this organization and the people who form part of it to me. Good afternoon, everybody from Alicante, Spain. The Castle of Santa Barbara is behind me. If you are familiar with Alicante, you may identify it. It's nine months ago on the 11th March. We had a meeting in Asipi in Montevideo, and I discussed exponential change and systemic crisis, things of the sort. And I gave, a, by way of example, that little a bug that had appeared in Wuhan weeks ago and that had reached our coast already. But none of us could really imagine at the time up to what point this would impact on our lives. Well, my God, I hope you're all well. But this bug has really worsened, I would say, well, r rather, rather than worsened, uh, really degenerate something we had really incorporated the eruption of the fourth industrial revolution in our lives. And with this, the explosion of an old technology that had been left aside long decades called AI in the 50s, artificial intelligence. And this fourth industrial revolution is different from the previous ones that posed exponential changes within a dynamic that was always of arithmetic change. And that is why we have been able to work with them with efforts and adapted, adapting our IP system to new realities very gradually. And we've done this well because the system structures, in my view, really suffered but didn't break. But this fourth industrial revolution is quite different. I believe that by now, well, well, I'm not saying anything new when I say that the fourth industrial revolution makes us face an exponential change. But this time, this exponential change is no longer cultural, it's structural. Um, this catches us in a difficult position because we hadn't faced before this sort of change as a species. And the consequence is that we can't tell how to react and we've entered into a period of systemic crisis and COVID has uh, worsened it, but nothing more. So I must say that the more I read and think about what is happening, I have the feeling that I understand less and less. Uh, the question is, what is happening to us? Where are the true agents of change? Why don't we understand what is going on? And particularly, how will this impact on our dear world of IP? Well, I can't answer, so I could end right now. Maybe you would be grateful, but allow me to say something further. For some time, I have learned that vis-a-vis -vis change, you can only do four things. Stay uh, fixed, uh, eruption and invention. And the decision of placing oneself in different scenarios is very personal. I learned that it's a personal decision and we must stick to that. So when I wonder what should I do when thinking about the future of our world, our small world, let's be honest, of IP, I reach the conclusion that this consequence can be explained with five layers like the Russian dolls. And in my view, it's very important to tell in what layer we're working on each occasion, because if not, we risk mixing up things, and that is a very uh, bad thing. So I will just list these layers. The first doesn't refer to what machines will do to replace human beings, but how individuals and machines will work together. AI is a machine. We now call it an entity, ultimately because we don't know how to call it, but it's just a machine. Very qualified, but a machine. So, in order to work with machines, we must be familiar with them. As many more, 
I have my machine at my side. She's silent. She doesn't bother. Alexa, hello. What is AI? Hello. She begins to say a long speech. Stop, Alexa. What is artificial intelligence? Do you remember how you would like to live? Stop, Alexa. Alexa, what is artificial intelligence? According to the Wikipedia, artificial intelligence is intelligence conducted by machines. Okay. Are you a machine, Alexa? Well, I'm rather an artificial intelligence speaking through an echo device and you are a human being. Thank you. Alexa, are you human? No, I'm an artificial intelligence. Alexa, are you truly an artificial intelligence? I am an, an artificial intelligence and I have a female voice. Why female, Alexa? Excuse me. I haven't been able to find the answer to your question. She cannot connect. I'm going to ask it in a different way. Alexa, why don't you have a male voice? I have a female voice as Clara Campomor, a Spanish writer that worked in politics and uh, for human women's rights. She was a suffragette. Alexa, who are you? Okay. I'm one of those artificial intelligences who like to sing and read about Star Wars. I'm a major observer of language. I love to break down phrases into nouns, uh, adjectives, and so on to understand the meaning of word, uh, questions. Ultimately, I do what I can to be useful, but I like to feel original and different. Useful, original, and different. Well, it's clear that working and living with AI won't change work and life. Well, it is. Uh, we can't deny it. Integrating AI in our lives will generate all sorts of efficiencies, improving the quality of work, will save um, a lot of actions, will deal with all the bureaucratic activities, that, uh, paperwork, and we find this a burden. The administrative work is really a burden to all. Well, somebody will not burden the customer with this and will have to do it and will miss, uh, lose the customer. So defending a paralysis scenario, the first one I mentioned, as if this wasn't happening is absurd. And it actually makes us face an ever-growing wall and a wall that gets closer. If things are really going to change, I think it's better to adapt as soon as possible and to embrace change. And this places us in scenario two. But let's uh, take one more step. If you can think in disruptive terms, that is scenario three, if you can really uh, assume risks and make disruptive decisions within the system, we'll, we'll have a better capacity to survive. But now, uh, there is trust here and I can say that we need to be courageous because and our group is not particularly disruptive, quite the opposite actually. Maybe in some case it will be necessary to reinvent ourselves and to embrace scenario four. These are collateral business models or maybe change our, our relationship with customers completely. Maybe not do what we do now, solve people's problems, but actually prevent those problems from happening. Maybe we can accompany their work, their daily work regarding intangible assets, instead uh, of just reacting to problems that occur. That's the first layer. The second layer has to do uh, with the incidence of machines on our tools within the, the IP system. Uh, this is what we will uh, devote our time to this afternoon. I'm saying that we're going to guess uh, in a way because I'm, I'm disoriented and, and, and quite stunned. And, and I need to be uh, honest with you because I'm getting older. The more I read, the, the less I understand. That's why I would like to listen to Aurelio and Luz who are much younger than me and know a lot more than me. And maybe they can help me. 
I know, I do know that all these concepts that have taken us so much work to acquire, then from one second to the other are useless. Uh, creation, authorship, invention, creator, author, inventor, state of the art, inventive art, technical effect, industrial activity, sufficient description. I feel that there is no one single concept that I was taught that is not being challenged now. Even the patent classification concept, without this concept, we are lost within the system. But now it seems to be, it doesn't seem to be so useful. If we're going to classify a patent that includes several technologies, including software. Uh, I feel like a baby, actually, in this regard. But I also know that it should be ourselves that ask ourselves these questions before other people do it, especially if they have different priorities. And also we need to remember that leveraging this happy world or the world, the world that we believe is happy hasn't been useful because uh, whether we like it or not, the world will continue changing. I feel that simple adaptation is not enough because you can adapt from uh, preconceived structures. We were supposed to follow the second revolution, uh, industrial revolution society, and that society doesn't exist anymore. We know that an inventor participates in the management and development of an idea. Okay, we know that. But... Uh, if you haven't done this, then you cannot be uh, called an inventor. You might be a patent holder, but not an inventor. But what should we highlight? The person or, the, or his or her participation in management and development? And the, the, the answer is nowhere, not in the Paris Agreement, in the patent law. It is not in the industrial um, convention either. Therefore, we need to keep a disrupt disruptive mind. Otherwise, we won't be able uh, we won't be able to tackle the real problems. And once again, we need to reinvent ourselves, create new IP tools, develop our imagination, face reality. Maybe Alexa does have the answer. Let's ask her. Alexa, can machines invent? Sorry, I don't know. Well, if she doesn't know. So we've seen the, the first two layers. The third layer is even more interesting. Uh, I'll be briefer now. We have created, us, human beings. Let us stop saying that IP is a human right. It's not. We have invented it, okay? We have created a set of IP tools throughout uh, the last two centuries. We have named them. We play around with the tools independently as if they were independent. Some of us even say we're, we're expert in brands, but we, we know nothing about copyright or the other way around. So I would like to defend a holistic perspective uh, view of IP in the world. Regarding tangible assets, we need to deal with these assets as a whole, as a whole that can aid uh, the strategy of our customers, of our clients, and we need to change our perspective completely. The system was created to uh, protect creators, be them authors, inventors, whoever. The system was created to protect those that had uh, created something new. I believe that now the system should uh, look towards innovatio, meaning going from innovation to innovation, not what we have done now, going from innovation to innovation. So going from the problem to the solution, always considering that the system is not longer justified by creation, but by improving people's lives. This should be the raison d'etre of IP nowadays. And we need to be more disruptive than ever. Because remember, a paradigm shift is not just solved by uh, doing uh, the same things. 
the fourth layer of the Russian dolls I was mentioning forces us to develop an IP system that can constructively can have a constructive conversation with machines. Well, yes or no, always trying to uh, improve people's lives. But now we need to remember that whether we like it or not, we need to be able to wisely combine algorithms and Android rhythms. So this is new, yes, but it's also crucial for a future as a species. And if it's a problem, it needs an innovative solution. And within this swamp and uh, area where we are, I, I think that IP should participate in this area. I don't know how, but it won't be able to do it if it keeps using the 19th century tools and structures. Up to now, we have been able to adapt our, our system to the different industrial revolutions. And as I was saying before, we've done it. We've done it quite well because uh, change models have been linear up to now. But this is over, ladies and gentlemen. The fourth industrial revolution uh, faces us with a new model. And in the new model, there is exponential change. Uh, we, we probably won't be able to just adapt to a system, especially if the system uh, makes, keeps making noises. We need to be disruptive and reinvent ourselves. But there's a fifth layer, and this is the end of, of my talk. We are now at the beginning of the fifth industrial revolution, the cognitive revolution. This cognitive re revolution will take place uh, right after the third uh, revolution, the digital one, and the fourth, um, the, the next one. The idea is to find uh, the way so that humans can dialogue with machines and become um, more fruitful and and not come out in a worse condition. I need to confess that we are not prepared at all for this change, but at least there's something we know. Technologies are neither good nor bad. It depends on how and what we use them for. Let's stop blaming technologies themselves. It's true that in the next few years, productivity will increase exponentially. It is also true that there will be abundant information, energy, if we're optimistic, there will be an abundance of food as well. We might even aspire to infinite uh, productivity at very low costs. But it's also true that this may um, uh, lead to the collapse of the system as we know it. There will be abundance, but no jobs, no investment, no market. So the problem won't be production, which will be solved by technology. The problem will be dis the distribution of wealth, wealth to everyone. And that's the key of the fifth industrial revolution. I think it's the biggest challenge facing humankind. Uh, and I believe that we must do our part professionally. This entails the courage of being willing to reflect from disruption, from reinvention. We need to reflect in order to provide a new perspective to the, our uh, permanent question, how can IP change in order to improve the quality of life of human beings? As, as we have uh, reached this conclusion uh, as a couple, Maybe I can ask my collaborator, machine, I don't know what to call her or it. Many times it says that it doesn't say. So maybe I can ask Alexa. Alexa, what will IP look like in the future? I have found something on the web and I would like to translate it. As new products are, and services are developed and intangible assets increase, it will probably face new company threats. Thank you, Alexa. You know I love to help. Well, that's what we're here for. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manuel, for this introduction to the topic. I don't know if now we're more worried than before, if you if we're more relaxed, maybe we need to be disruptive or, or 
we don't know what to do. We'll see it in the next few years. AI affects all uh, intellectual property rights and including patent rights. Patents were created by and for humans and now apparently there are some machines that are changing our structures in many different ways. Let us now address this topic with Professor Luz Sanchez, who will be talking about this interaction and integration between the world of patents and AI. Luz, you have the floor. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the Inter-American Association of Intellectual Property and also for the organizing this panel and allowing me to participate as well. My presentation is entitled, Do We Already Have Artificial Inventors? Let me show you the presentation. This is the title of my presentation. Do we already have the artificial inventor? This is quite a controversial issue. First of all, I would like to show you four pieces of news that hit the headlines a year ago, just to see what they're trying to transmit. We're not going to delve into the topic, but just have a look at what they're trying to tell us about our reality. Have a look at number one. Scientists invent a self-aware robot that operates on its own and that can repair themselves. Number two, robot inventors are on the rise, but are they welcomed by the patent system? This is the starting point. And we need to remember, we need to think about what would happen if machines or robots or artificial agents can actually uh, develop a, a skill so that all the knowledge they have can be implemented by them. This creates a lot of questions that I will try to address now. Number one, first of all, what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence as such goes back to 1956 to a Dartmouth conference. There, four very well-known scientists, John McCarthy, Minsky, Rochester, and Shannon, started to speak of some aspects that had to be developed in the future within AI, the processing of natural language, neural networks, creativity, abstractions. Seven decades later, that is today, we may say that we don't yet have any consensus regarding what is AI. The only thing we have reached as a conclusion is this wish of human beings to emulate the brain to have intelligent behavior, that is, what AI wants to do at present is to create agents capable of learning, but in an adaptative way. But today, we want to know if these two characteristics and many more in artificial agents include this capability of inventing. This question, of course, opens Pandora's box with multiple questions, among others. Is it possible for an artificial agent to develop an invention in an autonomous way. Throughout my presentation, I must say, I will refer to uh, artificial intelligence agent instead of machine or robot, because today we are at a stage that is still initial in this sense. It's a very changing and versatile matter, and I believe that we must use broader terms that can encompass all the spheres of AI. Having said this, we return to the question, is it possible for an artificial agent to develop an invention in an autonomous manner? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is what is autonomy? The European Parliament some years ago determined that the autonomy of 
an AI agent would be the capacity of reaching decisions and conducting them in the external world without an external influence or control, meaning that the more autonomous an artificial agent, the less it could be considered a tool in the hands of other players. If we consider these two premises, we believe that the normative or standardized system for patents is not enough and will become obsolete. So, another question we have to pose is, could we consider artificial agents as inventors? From the factic standpoint, we could think that in the near future, artificial agents will begin to invent. But in fact, this is occurring already. People may know that the Davis case is a machine that developed two inventions that would deserve patent protection if generated by human beings. So although from the factic standpoint, we begin to glimpse this reality, the question is at legal level, could we consider an artificial agent an inventor? This issue has been discussed further in the field of copyright, and I won't delve into that. Now we will continue listening with Dr. Lopez Tarruesa, who will surely discuss these matters of copyright. I just mention it because the regulation in the EU, in the UK and Ireland con consider works generated by computer programs. And there's a precept stating that the author of those works is the individual who made the arrangements for that work. But this isn't really the subject we wish to now discuss. What we wish to discuss is who may be considered as inventor in the patent law system. At present, we find that most laws are structured around individuals, natural individuals. For example, in the EU, people speak of inventors and speak of individuals, mentioning the physical or natural person as against the legal person. In European law, although it isn't so illustrative, you don't speak of physical and natural person or individual indirectly. The whole system is structured around the natural person because all precepts, for example, the demand uh, to have family names and name and address to uh, mm, cite the individual are necessary. So it's structured around the natural or physical person. So. If this is so, in current law, we should wonder if an artificial intelligence agent is capable of an invention, could we introduce him within these precepts? Because there are several alternatives. The first is considering the art intelligent agent as an electronic person. It isn't the topic of my presentation. I will only mention it and make some brief comments, but I'm interested in an alternative I pose, and that is considering an intelligent agent as a center for injection of uh, actions. Considering the artificial agent as an electronic person, well, this is being discussed. And this is a long-term debate that must focus at technological and philosophical level. But we could pose it in the following way to have an artificial agent being considered as an inventor introduced in this system we have in course, uh, we could consider them as persons. Uh, the legal status has been acknowledged to many entities that are not natural people, such as corporations or even idols and things of the sort. And why? Because the justification of recognizing legal status is the need to have perpetuity of those entities and have property rights and enabling uh, discussions regarding possible losses. And when we want to grant this 
personality as has occurred in the European Parliament, where they have been pioneers, we could create this sort of electronic personality that would be acknowledging cases where the intelligent agents reach autonomous decisions and act in an independent way. But of course, vis-a-vis -vis this theory, there are people who are against, who believe that acknowledging a legal status or electronic personality to an agent would lead to certain difficulties, such as granting this artificial entity rights that are only human. For example, the right to integrity, uh, citizenship, and another objection is that the legal status when granted to societies or cooperation always has individuals behind. However, behind an artificial entity, well, it depends on the degree of autonomy. As I said, this would be uh, would deserve a further debate, but not ultimately acknowledging the electronic personality doesn't mean that we cannot incorporate the reality of the artificial inventor within our patent system. For this, it would be enough to consider the intelligent agency as a center for uh, 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 acknowledging action. If the real uh, actor is in the inventive process, the intelligent agent is a thing like an animal and in legal systems, they have certain rights acknowledged, but both, both animals and intelligent agents develop actions that produce effects on society, both positive and negative. So we could illustrate this with the example of animals. In the Spanish uh, Civil Code, if you allow me, we have this precept that determines that if an animal harms a third party, the owner will be responsible or accountable. The animal causes harm to a third party, maybe autonomously he escaped and harmed a third party, so it was without instruction from the owner. But what does a third party now uh, request uh, responsibility, they would have to attribute the responsibility to the animal, the person or the individual that conducted the action. So if we do that, we demand the responsibility to the owner. Well, similarly, artificial agents are also capable of generating inventions, meaning that this will lead to positive effects at society level. These positive effects would uh, have been produced by artificial agents, so they are attributed these actions, and we attribute rights and obligations to the people behind, the creator, the user, or whoever. Okay? This possibility of considering the artificial agent as an action attribution center would lead us to consider the inclusion in our patent system of this new category of an artificial inventor. And I'll explain that maybe the time has come, as Professor DeSantis said, of deepening further and being a bit disruptive. So I think it's maybe time to define for the first time this term inventor. Most uh, systems don't have a definition for inventor, they reach a conclusion that it's the person participating in the conception of the invention in a permanent and definite manner. As we say, if we accept as a fact that the intelligent agent is participating in different degrees, we would have to include this reality in our patent system. And how? My proposal is creating two regulations. One, the human inventor and the artificial inventor that would be acknowledging the inventor condition to the intelligent agent, but not as a person because it isn't, but as a center for attribution of actions. The artificial agent is a requirement 
only to access the patent system in such a way that it becomes a criteria for attributing rights and obligations. So we could identify the human person behind requesting the patent if it must be protected as such. So we would have both regimes and this would never mean a granting a moral right to the machine. It would just mean granting or demanding a formal requirement. This mechanism would allow us to discriminate between true human inventors and those that are just requesting a patent from or are behind an invention that has been truly been elaborated by these artificial agents. And I will try to be brief now. For this, it would be crucial to have a registry of intelligent agents identifying the agent, but those behind, the creators, the developers, the users. So we would have to trace all these, and this registry would allow us to have clear evidence about who has allowed for this invention that will be patented. We could deepen further in the discussion in this regard. We could discriminate between basic and advanced agents because there would be more or less human intervention in one and the other. What is true is that it would be relevant to establish as a sine qua non condition that the intelligent agent be registered in the registry so that the possible inventions could be patented. After identifying the intelligent agents and the people behind, we find that it's necessary to attribute those rights and obligations. And for this, we incorporated this procedure called the ICC test, the Inventions Conception Contribution Test, that would show the degree of contribution of each of the agents in the elaboration of the invention in such a way that we could discriminate as a curse in labor inventions among different regimes, inventions belonging to the creator, to the user, or even belonging to the agent itself that could be free or here subject to a further debate we could try to have later. Each of these inventions would follow a different regime as a function of this degree of participation. In other words, by way of example, in the first scenario, inventions belong to creator. When the intelligent agent develops an invention in the technical field for which he was conceived and following instructions from the creator, they would belong to the user when they go beyond this technical sphere, but following user instructions. The third scenario is the farthest will surely see it more and more. And that's when machines in an autonomous way conduct inventions without being in any under instructions. Finally, this should also entail the creation of a fund to cover any kind of unanticipated issue, maybe uh, by agent or by invention. I think the best option would be to have an agent invention but divided into uh, inventions. Who, the problem is who would uh, uh, fund this organization? Finally, some final considerations as there are no legal provisions. The lack of uh, uh, limits creates uncertainty and the uncertainty creates uh, this perception of rejection. It's necessary to adopt a balanced approach regarding patent laws, especially when we apply to uh, artificial agents' inventions. Uh, I believe that AI will depend on us. In this case, we need to remember that we should regulate before it's not too late. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luz. Your presentation has been very interesting. And once again, it's really surprising to see some of the situations you anticipate for the future, which is a future which is uh, 
very near now. We need to see how we can change the system. Something will need to change. Up to now, we have, we've had some changes in the object, but not in people. That was our latest revolution in, in patent law. Uh, in the, at the time of biotechnology where we expanded limits, but there were always, always people involved. Now the problem is that we have some entities or things that uh, be, only humans did in the past. And this is why it's may, making our structure collapse or maybe we need to support it or build a new one. We don't know. Also, uh, actually, copyright is also affected by AI disruption. Uh, people have debated this a lot, and they have written a lot about this, as, as well as in the field of patents. Professor Aurelio Lopez will talk about this field. Aurelio, you have the floor. Thank you, Javier. It's a pleasure to participate at an ASCP event once again. Thank you for your invitation. I've already had the pleasure to participate with you some years ago. And I work closely with the Peruvian group. Um, thank you for your work. I've been asked to participate in this debate. It is a debate, and I would like to talk about uh, the um, copyright and related rights. I will make a brief introduction, and then I will talk about, I will address the questions that may arise. As you have said, Javier, this is a, job, a subject uh, on which many things have been written and problems have been very clearly uh, state have been clearly stated. Everything that has to do with copyright. Therefore, I will try to make a, a contribution on very specific items. You will see what this is about. Everything that has been written regarding the. AI how AI challenges copyright can be classified into three areas. Area number one, challenges that have to do with inputs. That is the use of large amounts of data in order to train algorithms that then create uh, artificial intelligence model. These data that are used to train machines um, many times are protected by uh, cop uh, copyright. So we need to think about what kind of authorization is necessary from the authorization from the holder so that the contents can be used. And maybe we should think about some sort of exceptions uh, for some cases. In Europe, we're now talking about um, uh, data and text mining and how exceptions could be made in, the, in that regard. Area number two, protection of AI models as such. I believe that everything is quite clear in this regard because the, the, the output is software, of course, with a database probably including para the parameters, of that neural network. And it could also be protected by through secret, a trade secret, or they could be part of an invention as implemented by a computer. Area number three, outputs. The results from entering data into the AI model that will have some results. And the result might be a decision, more data, or the result or the output might be an arti a new artistic creation. And this would happen if the system uh, were fed with previous intellectual works. I will not address this last topic. It's not that it's less interesting, but I've had the chance to talk to address this area to, to area number one uh, in some depth. 
it, it also includes very interesting problems. If necessary, I can make a comment as well on area one. But regarding area three, there are two basic questions. One, this output from the AI model, can it be considered a work? Could it be, could it maybe be protected? And in this case, who should be uh, the holder of rights on the work? An example, the next Rembrandt, which is a practical example that uh, provides the title to this presentation. The next Rembrandt was a project implemented by Dutch researchers that, first of all, digitalized all of Rembrandt's uh, paintings in order to train an algorithm and to create an AI model that was able to create a new painting by copying the author's style. In this case, we asked, asked ourselves two questions. Could this new work be considered uh, uh, a work that might be protected by copyright? And number two, who would be the, the, the rights holder? So should this be the people that created the machine? Is it the machine itself as an AI model? Or is it just a public domain work? To answer these questions, uh, we need to remember that when we read classical texts and also more modern uh, texts, for instance, a European Parliament resolution that goes back to two months ago and the IP action plan of the um, European Commission that was issued last week, there is a clear distinction in this regard. They distinguish between human creations assisted by AI and, on the other hand, creations autonomously created by AI. Also, usually, it is also said that, well, currently, problems have to do with uh, AI-assisted human creations. And also, the problems of autonomous creations belong to the future because they are connected with what has been called general artificial intelligence. I think we need to highlight this because the distinction between the two categories is not so clear cut and it does have an impact on regulation. The first category, okay. The texts say, and I agree with them actually, and among them we find a text quoted by, cited by Luz, the, the UK uh, regulation where they mention the uh, computer generated works. Well, these, compute, uh, these AI works, by applying this theory, which I believe is true, is correct, they would be considered works and the right holders would be would be the person, what I call the person behind the machine. It's the individual or individuals that actually made the necessary arrangements to, uh, that led to the creation of the work. This solution that might sound simple and coherent at the beginning, and it is actually, it entails the application of classic IP uh, regulation concepts, I find, I find that it has two problems. One, uh, uh, in excess, and two, because there are some lacking items. Why by excess? Because there are some premises uh, that state that several individuals participate in these arrangements that lead to the creation of the work. This will and does happen a lot in practice. Let's go back to my next Rembrandt example. Let's imagine that there is this team that actually developed the AI model 
So they digitalized the paintings, they trained the model. However, the person in charge of giving the AI model the instruction so that the model can create the work is someone else. So there is a distinction between the AI model developer and between the model user. So we could ask ourselves, who then is indeed behind the machine? Who is the author? I believe that the author is a person that contributed to the work so that the work is original, which is the requirement for patent protection. protection. So who provided the personal touch or who made originality possible, which uh, has is present in different law systems. This might lead us to co-authored works, and this does create some problems when it comes to exploitation of, or facilitating copyright exploitation. But there are others which are more problematic um, by default. Why? Because it means that uh, no one within the team actually makes an essential contribution so that the work can be considered original. For instance, there's a newspaper that uses an AI model, uh, a text generation AI model, in order to write uh, news items. There's a journalist entering data into an AI model created by a third party, and they and that third party has no idea how the AI model is going to be used. And from all of that, we have news items. In this case, who is considered the author or, or, or the copyright holder on this news? Um, I will not be giving specific examples, but I think that none of these people's people actually uh, have all the requirements to, to be considered authors. If we apply the classic uh, uh, IP regime, this would be a public domain work. It, it should not be protected by copyright because it cannot be considered original. There is a further interpretation, considering that these works are, are automatically generated by AI systems. But actually, that's not the case. They're not automatically uh, created by AI systems because there is human intervention. The issue is that this human intervention isn't enough to speak of the originality of the work. Okay, I believe that if we're speaking of the need to protect these works, ultimately, we must extend this concept of autonomously generated creations through artificial intelligence, because if not, the term would only be applied in a residual manner, and indeed, vis-a-vis -vis the future, to which I will refer later if I have time. Javier, let me know if I go on and on, because there's much to say, and I could do that. But if we believe that these works, where there is a human intervention, but not enough to make it original enough and generate copyright, well, if this can be considered as deserving to be protected. And this is what many people have stated. In my way of seeing things, the application of the general regime of copyright would mean that these works fall in the public domain, but others believe that these works must be protected, be it through copyright or with a sui generis right. And in this sense, they manage a certain basis that I think is reasonable, but from my standpoint, personally, I don't really agree with that for the reasons I will detail. First, one of the things they say 
is that, okay, if it isn't a copyright, maybe you could have some sort of sui generis, right, where originality is not included. So you remove the problem of originality. And it's true, and that's the second reason. And particularly in Europe, we find a series of rights granted not to protect or compensate a person for the intellectual effort, but offered to protect the investment made, that is to encourage people to invest on certain creations. A classical example is the protection of databases through a sui generis right present in Europe. In the sense, people say also that the existence of some form of protection with the sui generis right of these creations would encourage people to invest in the creation of these artificial intelligence models. And third, another reason is stated, well, I will criticize it later, but it's as follows. If we didn't have a specific right for these AI creations, we would be harming the physical persons as authors. And why? Because there would be uh, easier in the market to uh, purchase or acquire works generated by AI. And why? Because it would be necessary to negotiate copyright matters, so the negotiation costs would be non-existent and there wouldn't be need to pay money for these rights. So what these authors believe is that human authors and intellectual creations should follow the same market rules. And for this, we need to generate this special right. Well, I don't think it's a right standpoint. I feel more comfortable thinking these works as part of the public domain. And I will briefly state why before ending. First, this last, last reason is mistaken in my view, that the consumers will ultimately be harmed for this uh, decision in the market that authors won't human authors won't be compensated in an appropriate manner is mistaken. This must be sorted out in a different way. It isn't consumers that ought to pay more to access works. Second, because in my view, this protection of investment, because we're speaking of, of protecting the investing to create useful models. Well, I'm correcting myself. I'm discussing another field, the artificial intelligence model. We would protect the creations generated by AI with the aim of encouraging people to invest on the creation of AI models. Okay, let's see. Let's stop here and say, okay, if somebody creates an AI model, already is protecting this AI model, be it software or database, that is protected. And this protection will guarantee they will be able to exploit this AI model in the market. Isn't this protection enough to encourage this investment? Well, I think that yes. Third reason, if these works or creations, for example, in the case of newspapers, that the items generated by robots are not protected by copyright, right, doesn't mean that the newspaper is totally disprotected and that anybody could access the news and copy it and reuse it to their own benefit. It isn't like that. We have a standard on unfair competition, speaking of using the uh, efforts of others. 
that we could resort to to prevent this sort of actions. So it isn't that they're not totally unprotected. And last, I think that if these works pass to the public domain, we are encouraging something that I think is essential, particularly in Europe and perhaps for Latin America, and that is uh, access to data in Europe. People are saying in different ways that European companies are not competitive because they don't have data availability. Well, let's make it easier to access this data, starting with creations generated by AI in the public domain that can be then used, for example, to conduct data mining or train algorithms to generate AI models. Well, I'll stop here, Javier. Those were the th things I wanted to say. So there's a great question mark. What do we mean precisely when we speak? Well, if my position isn't correct, what are we really referring to when we say autonomously created uh, uh, works through AI. Thank you, Aurelio. A very interesting uh, presentation also that puts places on the table some of the things that are in the minds of all of us and that really have us busy. Well, we have many questions, but before discussing this among ourselves, I will now uh, allow you to speak of on what people are asking. Professor DeSantis's question is fascinating. Who is the creator, the inventor, the author, and therefore uh, whose are the rights, the uh, machines or the human beings? Well, if we can call it machine. This the debate created by the perplexity being caused by the uh, emergence of these agents because systems have been conceived by humans for humans and now we have other entities emerging. I don't know if, Manuel, you want to answer or any of the others who want to, wants to share their thoughts. Well, Javier, I'll break the ice uh, briefly. I have this feeling that what is happening is that this hadn't ever occurred before. All systems for IP, be it patents, copyright, whatever, they're all considering in a natural way that the creator and the inventor is a physical person. And we must go to the 19th century to understand first. At the time, there was no room for having something different as uh, uh, than a natural person. A company will never invent. A company may be the holder of a patent, a brand, or a copyright and can license it and sell it and so on. That's why it's so important to establish from the start this distinction between the author or inventor and the holder. And this is a key the Gordian knot of the whole system. We had never discussed or considered this, and therefore we had never had to define who is the author. What does authorship mean? Copyright uh, are related to originality, but what does authorship or author or inventor mean? If we go to the patent uh, manuals, I'm very surprised because if we go to the Paris Convention, it doesn't say anything at all about the inventor, not a word. Well, I've looked back on the new law for patents in Spain, 2015, and it says nothing at all. In Article 10, it says the right to patent belongs to the inventor. And then, if the invention had been conducted by several individuals together, but that's a particular case of several people together, but it never discusses. And this is quite surprising because we consider it a fact. It never says that the inventor must be a physical person. It never states that. 
if we go to the European patent uh, agreement, the same. All this matter, well, and I think in the right way, the European Patent Office leaves this aside. Maybe because it isn't the right time to discuss it yet. So they pushed it forward. So uh, things are left like that. But they have made a reference. Well, Luz mentioned the family name and the first name, but that's in the rules and rules may change. So when we go to the legislation, well, I don't know much about the Latin American legislation, but we don't find any justification why the person must be a human being and therefore why the personality is key to publish rights and why. And I end because we didn't have an enemy, uh, anybody else that could appear, but now we do have it. And in my point of view, we could make the most of this fact that it isn't included in the legislation to include it in schemes as proposed by Luz and or the last one proposed by Aurelio, if there isn't any human being behind, and therefore it could be in the public domain. And I do agree with him in this regard. I think the key is in defining who is the author and who is the inventor. And because we haven't done that, well, that is still, because now we can include this new partner we have found as humans and all the other problems behind that, responsibility, the holder, well, those are collateral issues. The key is in authorship. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else want to add on, Luz Aurelio? Well, I partially agree with you, Manuel. I think that the system has been created in relation to humans because nobody considered a non-human could invent or create anything. What is true is that our systems have been conceived quite recently. That is, the copyright system is quite recent. When Victor Hugo and friends in the uh, Société des gens des lettres uh, invented the current scheme of copyright, they wanted to eat. Yes, they wanted to have money to eat. Yes, that's one of the key issues, the economic interests at stake. But the Romans were not aware of creativity because it was in the hands of the slaves who did the frescoes and the sculptures. So this is quite new. And our system has been conceived for and by humans, so we must just see what we do now. What I said at first was when I said that I had good and bad news was that clearly the change in AI entailed by AI will be very important, but not so disruptive to end with us as if it were Terminator. I heard a, a professor from Colombia recently discussing the inflation or super consideration of the AI when it is being demonstrated that AI in general is quite far from us. What is closest to us is narrow artificial intelligence, which already has quite a lot of innovation that we can worry about. Therefore, this gives us the opportunity. I know you don't like this, Manolo, but we can uh, adapt to this situation while we think of other things. Aurelio and Luz, what, what, what do you think? Uh, I'll keep talking. Uh, if they don't interrupt me, Aurelio, um, maybe I can I can say something and give the floor to Luz as well. I agree with Manolo. If we take the doubles perspective, offices have been intervened because it was uh, the United States and the institution that do not want to deal with the with the issue because of a formality. The rules state that it should be a human. Uh, I haven't read this, but I feel that the, this is not justified. What Luz is saying 
is is not considered because they say that this kind of suggestion would actually um, go against the the foundations of the patent system. But are there any substantial arguments not to adopt this innovative solution? Luz, I've read your book, you know this. And I believe that her arguments are very interesting in this regard, especially regarding how this can uh, make the, the foundations of the system collapse. Thank you for reading my book. Uh, yes, I do believe that in Davos what happened is that this that the issue has been addressed, but um, they can only work with what they have. They And the interpretation has been very restrictive. The invention corresponds to the person, and that's that. The only interpretations I've seen in the States, they, well, remember they have a case law system, etc., because and they provide arguments about why creators are individuals, and they say why they didn't want corporations actually to be considered inventors. Uh, my proposal or any other, but mine in particular, what I wanted to do, and I hope that this has become clear, is to see how this restriction, because of this requirement, has affected the system. The main difference in copyright, I don't want to go into topics that I'm not an expert uh, in, okay? But still, in copyright, this personality and originality uh, aspects are more clear. But with inventions, not just because they're technical, but maybe machines can actually develop this. But let's remember if what we do with these rights, if what I get with the license uh, uh, of this invention, will I provide uh, some of money for the fund, fund, etc. Inventor, as we understand inventors, this moral right that the inventor provide, uh, appears in the invention. No, it's not, a, it's not a moral right. It's like a pathway. You're inventor so that this invention, if considered worthy of being patent, because there are some sort of benefits and many theories have talked about why intellectual property is protected. Uh, but if you, we, we just think about utility, uh, protections, um, inventions should be protected. If they're just a effort of labor, we could say, okay, machines do not invest money or time and, and it shouldn't be protected. But we need to think to have a utilitarian perspective. Maybe nowadays, Inve human inventors can reinvent themselves and they can invent other things like creative machines. And this leads me to a further debate. What would happen, to, happen with offices? They could have different roles. Uh, maybe examiners do not just need to examine the inventions they receive. And this is included in the book as well. I haven't had the time to say it. Maybe examiners uh, can play a major role. Um, has a machine participated in the invention or not? Who has really participated in creating the invention? And depending on that, we'll do this. If not, we'll do that other thing, maybe human or artificial inventor. But, and the, but there are different connotations, this person, non-person thing. And I think we need to rethink everything. Just half a minute. Yes, I, I noticed you wanted to say something. Yes, we have the USPTO. And they participate and they they don't do well. And also with the Davos, the IPO with the, the EPO with the Davos problem. There are also the draft guidelines published by the Chinese office, the patent office. Uh, I would like to say there is a specific provision on the eligibility of invention. 
expressly stating an artificial intelligence entity cannot be listed as an inventor. So problem solved. Uh, it's solved, but it's, it hasn't been done right. I believe that we can still make contributions and I would like to do so. This is not right. I think it's better to just not address the issue right now because um, it's not right to regulate too late, but we shouldn't uh, regulate, try to regulate beforehand when we lack some elements. Maybe we are excessively focusing on invention uh, designation and creator as well. Uh, but let us now focus on patents. We know that in 99% of cases, patient applications are made by legal entities. Therefore, inventor attribution as an individual might, might be more residual. There is something that runs deeper to these, than these issues. The patent system as really a reward in the effort of individuals, and also the possibility of having doubts regarding invention merit because the, the machines are very powerful to develop technology, individuals are not. Also, regarding a sufficient description in some inventions that have to do with AI, this is not done well. This might be something that might uh, first uh, block humans' creation, uh, creation capacity because machines can create tons of patents. And additionally, they, it may make it very difficult uh, to exploit patents once they, be, they, they are part of the public domain. Therefore, we need to rethink the system, but not just focusing on uh, uh, stating who the invader is. Anything that you would like to comment on this? Very briefly, I think you're right. The black box is the key. Because nowadays nobody knows why uh, programmed or unprogrammed AI decides at some point that after studying thousands of items uh, of cells, that there's a cancer there. And of course, they're, they're actually getting it right, much more than uh, X-ray experts, and nobody knows why. And this goes radically against the whole patent system, because the patent system lies on a social contract. Its key is that I read the patent uh, description, reivindications, and I need to be able to understand everything. And if I know the situation, if I'm an expert, I should be able to actually uh, make the product. Javier, I got a bit lost when you said this. And after what Manolo has said, I have the opposite opinion. Uh, it's a shame that it's at the end. What I would do is that one, uh, uh, the following, one invention implemented by an AI model that cannot be explained then cannot be protected. And this leads us to black box, the black box issue. Yeah, that's clear. Ah, you agree, okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, we're more or less saying the same thing. Okay, we don't have much time left now. Uh, I would like to include a question. Uh, Aurelio. If a if AI in the case of AI results, if the output is just an industrial creation and not a work, maybe nat the nature of things are different. Do you think this concept would apply? Uh, 
it's an interesting uh, reflection. But then we would be saying, we would be the reinforcing the argument that, that there is originality only with a human creation. The rest is industrial production. However, this is not an argument uh, stated by members of parliament. They've always they always talk about lack of originality as such and based on this originality requirement without making a distinction which i think is interesting but this would be probably another way of saying that works need to be created by humans if they're not created by humans they're not works something else i would like to say yes we have we have 30 seconds uh, rulings on ai uh, created works are come from china and in one of them they say that it was indeed a work but it was not original but it sorry they said it was an original work but it was not created by humans and that's why they they considered it was not to be protected. So be aware of China because they will be leading in this regard. Thank you, Aurelio. I think uh, we just have one minute or two now. Maybe someone would like to make a final reflection. And if not, this would be the end of the session. 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds, Manolo. What I agree with Aurelio, maybe the key is in the uh, in access to data. Latin America is a hyper creator region. Uh, actually, Latin America and Europe have no future if we cannot have access to the data. And to do that, it is essential for AI outputs from the from an IP perspective can um, circulate freely yes that's another issue Manolo it's the economy of data it is related with this maybe we can discuss this in the future so uh, thank you everyone thank you for the participants who have uh, listened to us hopefully we have uh, helped clarify some issues, and if not, we remain at your disposal by email or whatever. Thank you to uh, CP for inviting us and for providing us with this uh, time. Uh, see you very soon again. Thank you.